Thank you everyone for joining me on the season 4 of Make It Happen show. My first guest, Tanya Rajkopal, is an architect and urban planner interested in community engagement and applied research. She loves maps, benches, libraries, slacks, and engaging with people across all age groups. She believes that cross disciplinary collaborative design is key to improving standards of equity and quality of life in cities. Her interest lies particularly in innovative management practices of the public realm and urban commons. She is also one of the founding members of the Placemaking India and director at Mixed. In this episode, we talked about her journey as a researcher and participatory designer, her stories from India, and also talked about vision of Placemaking India and more. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. I am Azban Sari, the founder of the organization Peacemakers Pakistani. And I am bringing you the stories of placemakers, artists, and professionals from around the globe about how they created an impact and made change happen. You are listening to the Making It Happen show. Thank you for joining in. Enjoy the episode. Hello, Dunya. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you and how's going? How's life going? I'm great. I'm doing awesome and i'm so happy to be part of this podcast that has had some really impressive guests in the past so i'm really looking forward to it i'm glad to add you to the guest list um i'm so happy to have you here and uh, we didn't get the chance to do it but i want to know the meaning of your name it's so unique <laughs> danya actually it's sanskrit but also hindi it means fortunate or blessed uh yeah but some people also mistake it for dhani yeah you know the spice <laughs> which uh, is not the same thing but yeah if it's it's supposed to mean dhania which is fortunate or blessed yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's a cute name you know it's uh, in our country we have we have this name dhania so it does resemble mm-hmm. that the pronunciation yeah so lovely okay So shall we begin with our questions because I'm looking forward to knowing your answers. Okay, uh, okay so tell Let's me Nania. Yes, how did you find your passion for public spaces and place making? For me, um uh, it really did start before my masters, you know, when I did my bachelor's thesis, it was based on this uh, resettlement site. it was supposed to be an architecture project but somehow my uh, proposals ended up being an experiential learning center but it was in a slum resettlement site which had a lot of vacant space and the resettlement site itself was along a river and i i really wanted to look into that space and see how we can accommodate some of the functions that the community didn't have like uh, it it was basically a community uprooted from their original places of living and then resettled so i was really curious about how that would work in a setting like uh chennai where it was called the kanagi nagar resettlement site which was my bachelor's thesis and i was really looking at how the public spatial aspect could be adding more um you know like opportunities for the communities to come out of their homes which were very poorly designed very poorly designed private places which could contribute to like a more uh, expansive uh, access to their public spaces the river the parks that were badly maintained so i think that was when i realized i i liked even in my architecture time so looking into public spaces and not just buildings but the quality of how the buildings itself are in that space you know so um yeah i think that was the first initiation to this idea cool okay so i think uh, that's relatable because uh, that's exactly how mm-hmm. my shift was uh, shift happened you know from architecture towards urban and place making oh, that's interesting uh, because it was more like that's uh, interesting yes meeting people and how they were looking forward to your help you know it was in the slum area mm. i visited the slum area we were just having yeah. a walk around that place and they were they were curious what we are going to do for their betterment 
and um, my you know mm-hmm. my reflective feelings were that if we are creating an environment inside but the outside or the adjacent neighborhood is not um, working well for other people then it won't work for us as well because it will uh, increase the you know the unsafety the insecurity issues and there will be no no safety and crime rates will be you know these factors will count yeah definitely so we shall work on this area and i think uh, working with the settlements is something which is very uh, deep and tough but very rewarding as well yeah so yeah. yes i have yeah uh questions to learn from you now <laughs> so yeah that's great <laughs> okay so you are one of the five founding members of place making india and uh, i would like to know that um how did you arrive to that and what are your aims and objectives and the lessons so far yeah i mean the idea of place making in india probably after covid it took off because more people started realizing that incremental changes were possible and it would have an impact in a community level in a city level and uh, i think vinita shetty started this whole uh, movement in india taking inspiration from place making us and place making x uh, but then uh, she was really interested in bringing together multiple disciplines people with different uh, experiences into the foray and i was already active in that space after my masters and it really we had an initial conversation and we realized that you know place making in india probably already happens you know uh, much like most south asian and uh, places where these are organic things have already been happening Uh, now we have a name for it which is called place making but maybe we have other names that are re- significant for our region and it really started with this discussion of india is so diverse and each state has its own language you know like how do we get all of that to be in a collective uh, you know name called place making india so it started with the conversation and understanding that our nature of place making should be very different from the western way of place making or uh, you know it's it's not just about creating uh, plazas that are nice to sit in and but it's a lot more like there's a dynamic of a lot of uh, you know politics spatial uh, politics as well as um, you know uh, systems of access all these play an important role which we have to solve for along with just building spaces you know like maintaining spaces is also important so i think there was a need for it and there was, it was a perfect timing and before covid we we had this opportunity to like we are doing now sit across you know a screen and come up with ideas and that's i think when we really realized the importance of uh, having this movement in india and i'm glad to have been uh, involved as part of the communications aspect uh, in the beginning so it it's most membership driven and driven by volunteers so we spend our time helping with uh, these initiatives in our own free time so that's how it was uh, created not like not different from what you have done in pakistan with peacemakers pakistani so yeah uh yes uh, this uh, i think we are mutual we have a mutual concept about this one like we need to focus on our own identities and we have to build from there yes that's the right thing and uh, i would i would say that we i haven't done anything right like this for now uh, because a lot of things mm-hmm. i wanted to resolve before starting the network um you know i had a very different concepts let's say that because i was the one who was bringing this network or this movement to pakistan mm-hmm. um and in an announcing manner because you you are exactly right. doing the same thing that we have been doing this thing which is place making but we yeah. we don't know the word for it you know we didn't have it's in our nature mm. let's say it's in our nature so 
Yes. Maybe, but I needed to know uh, know a lot of things because I was a fresh graduate. I was just learning about things. I was exploring <laughs> things. So, and I also wanted to do things naturally and let the mm. system adopt from myself, you know. So, yes, right. now we are heading towards this thing and let's see how it, how it will go. So, I think Let's Making Pakistan has to be established for now. Mm-hmm. It has been, uh, pe- I have been presenting it through peacemakers only, but now I'm building yeah. towards more networks, more systems, because uh, my approach has been to connect to people mm-hmm. who are actually doing things already and then yeah. see how things will go. So that That's a great way, because I think place making should not just stop with having conferences and events. Exactly. I definitely think that it should result in some sort of working with the the local neighborhoods or doing something actionable on the ground exactly. could be policy changes could be changes in the spatial design or thinking about access uh yeah just like looking at what a community already needs and then working from there i think that will be the real impact of you know a network like ours so that be exactly. useful exactly yes and being a doer if i'm not doing something i will not never be fulfilled you know so yeah this is something that I really wanted to focus on. And uh, yes, every lesson came with its time. And I'm mm-hmm. so happy to have this global network supporting each other yeah. amazingly. And yes, Vitita Shetty is amazing. She reached out to me as well when mm-hmm. we did the Pakistan India yeah. series, you know. And uh, we yeah. got in touch through that, remember? I yeah, think yeah, yeah, yeah. It was during that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so, and uh, placemaking. India is uh, also, um, it has been happening like placemaking week India started in 2022. Mm-hmm. 2021. Yeah. So placemaking what? week is really great because it's, it sort of gives you an experience of a particular place and it curates events in a specific way, but it is also an opportunity to align with that particular city's already existing maybe government policies or ongoing issues in the urban area which might sometimes need like external uh, help or you know like sometimes we collaborate with uh, universities uh, that already work in that city but uh, they they are the ones who help us with taking around the city taking us through the uh, taking us on a tour of that particular site so we try to see if we can work on existing projects already and of course Vinita has been spearheading a lot of that ideas but um, it's a network that has helped each other out exactly. uh, right from uh, you know from different uh, regions and cities there's a lot of learning that we do and the end goal really is to do something actionable uh, uh, and not just limited to conferences and um, you know uh, tours and uh, although they are very important aspects of experiencing a place we want to initiate projects get funding <laughs> try to make some uh, tangible uh, changes to the spaces that we go to either through support or through direct collaboration with that particular region's uh, you know, governments or private stakeholders who would be interested in doing something different with that space it can be a vacant space or a, a you know active space that needs more uh, you know economic vitality to it. So yeah, it's been it's evolving. It's constantly evolving. It's it's always get getting better, but uh, there's a lot of scope there for it to become uh, a network of action. Yeah. Exactly. I, I used to say that it's place making, it's a verb. <laughs> Do something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's a verb. It's, that's great. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I want to know that uh, where are you from India and uh, you would would you like to share any place attachment stories from it? Yeah, sure. I was actually, uh, I'm born in Chennai. So it's a southern coastal city um, and the coast always brings with it its own, you know, like uh, memories and smells and, you know, the humidity, of course. Uh, so, yeah, I, I had this Twitter handle, which I don't use anymore, which the caption used to say that I'm from the land of dosas and kacheris. And uh, uh, and kacheris are like very South Indian in a way that 
it's about music there's a season of just celebrating music um and i have been brought up in that world where you know uh, i went to school in this very very orthodox neighborhood uh, and then i had this relationship with the sea where i'm constantly uh, exposed to uh, you know the economic activities vibrancy there and so there is the temple there's the beach and there is uh, a lot of um music everywhere i go you know so uh these are like some of the memories that come to my mind and of course i can't finish a play story without the food and you know everything that comes with uh the taste and the local cuisine so for me those are still always part of my uh i would say my place attachment uh so yeah uh, the chai is so different in chennai versus bangalore versus you know uh, bombay it's it's just unique it's just different so i think that lends itself to bringing uh, people into the uh, space and uh, for me the sea has always had a special uh, place in my both in my work which i didn't even think about it but somehow the beach keeps coming back in my work and uh, that's sort of how i started my thesis as well so yeah um i have very fond memories of the beach <laughs> lovely and having you know that um i can feel that calmness in you you know i do believe <laughs> that being raised uh, or being you know being raised near a water body or see something it has an impact on you i, I definitely believe that probably from the healing perspective probably. as well and also you mentioned about uh, the food and um <laughs> that's thing something which is very prominent in asia you know we love food mm. and we have a very yeah. special kind of food and i am um, kacheris and dosas when i went to karachi in december we saw that uh, there were dosas serving there were serving dosas and kacheris yeah. uh, i think <laughs> we have kacheri in lahore but dosas was the first thing that we saw over like <laughs> in our life maybe <laughs> um mm-hmm. also that you mentioned uh, there's a season of music is it the basant one is it basant what do we no, so the, so uh, the season of music is called in my city it's it happens in december uh, and it's called margari uh, although it has been mostly associated with religious classical music it has become sort of the season where okay. artists from all over the world travel to the city uh, to just do any kind of art uh, you know it's it's transformed it's slowly transformed from being only in in uh, sabhas where they have classical music to you know it being about folk music traditional was and folk and bringing dance forms um, so it it's been the entire season is called the kacheri season in in tamil but it's also like uh, bringing up artists from different world different parts of the world and that happens only in chennai which is very unique to its region so uh, i lived next to a dance school uh, called kalakshetra and it has always been a buzz of you know musicians and artists and uh, it has and it's also next to the sea so it's it's got the best of both worlds right? oh, that's i would awesome. say so yeah and you play music as well you play, play guitar i guess yeah yeah that's cool yeah yeah i i started off as a classical singer because everyone in my community when you grow up you grow up learning some classical music that's just a rite of passage i think and guitar and ukulele was something i just picked up because the that was like a freedom of doing music on my own without just not just singing but also you know singing with others or jamming with others and um, it it was a very mobile instrument like a, it's a portable instrument you can take it outside and play in a public space and um, uh, you know you can just go in in your uh, balcony and sit there and vibe on your instrument that, that was very interesting for me so uh, yeah music has always been a part of my life as well yeah such a free spirit you are <laughs> i can i can now get it <laughs> okay so tell me what are your observations and lessons about urban commons in india and what are the challenges and opportunities there so 
my introduction to urban commons is also during my thesis when i was studying about uh, the coastal commons but there has been a lot of previous work done on the coastal commons by you know the coastal resource center and uh, there's also dakshin uh, in bangalore they are like concentrating only on that but for me when i started off i looked at coastal commons through the perspective of places and how it can be governed better uh, because it's neither public nor private completely it's a shared resource right it's a it's a common resource and the assumption is that if it is common that it belongs to everybody and belongs to nobody and it becomes useless right that's the assumption but uh, like it, that that's when i was introduced to the works of elena rostrom who's like a nobel laureate uh, who did a work her economics uh, work was on uh, disproving the tragedy of commons saying if a group of uh, you know uh, if a group of stakeholders took care of a common resource and they did it with a set of principles or rules that they associate with that resource to make sure that they don't uh, you know like make it scarce but make sure that it's they give enough time for it to like sustain and regrow then there will be no tragedy of commons in fact that's how a lot of our fishing commons and a lot of the grasslands have always been safeguarded by such negotiations and rules that they have traditionally set so that coastal commons uh, problem in india is is that there is no uh, method for people to take care of their commons either it is limited or it is not considered a, like a legitimate way of taking care or managing a space like it's just assumed that unless a government or a private institution or a private agency manages or governs the place it's not management that's absolutely not true right so but communities can take care of these like these fishermen who uh fisher folks because we have to use both uh, uh you know include both fishermen and fisher women into the conversation so they take care of the space and uh, they have a set of rules so each co- coastal community has these unset rules that you know you don't overfish the sea you wait for the 45 days of breeding period of the fish uh, and uh, ocean um, habitat to regrow and adapt uh, so and and they have boundaries as well which you don't see on a map but they have unset boundaries so it was really interesting for me to understand that that strip of sand that we think in a lot of public uh, maps and public policy maps uh, before the coastal resource center came into the picture uh they used to call that beach area where the sand is as a no man's land uh, essentially saying that it ha- it is a land without value unless and until someone like a private developer builds a hotel or a seaside resort or something like that you know so that notion was always there and it it, it was such an interesting uh, phenomena in chennai where uh the beach in which i used to live next to uh, behind there was uh, this pioneer called sarvanan who works with the coastal resource center but he was also born in one of these uh, fishing communities he took it upon himself to show that these lands were not you know no man's land they were valuable land where we park the boats of the fish where we dry our uh you know like a uh, catch for the day where we repair nets where we do rituals for the sea so all these were undocumented but these were stories of the sea and they somehow made that visible and it was i think that was the moment i realized okay urban commons is a very interesting uh space uh which is not fully public space because they don't have rules like public parks you know like but it is a very uh uh contested space wherein if you don't have some negotiations between the people who use the beach versus you know the people who live along the beach and use it as a livelihood if you don't have that negotiation it it becomes a problem uh, about ownership so the, it, there was a mismanagement in in the case of commons and that's not just in the coastal commons i would say urban commons uh, you know you can 
you can say that about any urban common in in this in this part of the world uh but yeah it's been an interest for me since and i have written about it uh in several occasions both from the perspective of political urban commons but also from the spatial urban commons so and you will see both these almost always clashing yes it, and it makes sense to me because um once i came to the conclusion that if we need training then we need training for the consultants and the management team right. i think because they yeah. will really adopt to it and they know things yeah. how to work for it uh, we can't train people who are moving through a place naturally right. you know? so we need training for the management and consultants to learn from them and then yeah something which is best for them i think this is the yeah. way to do things place making yeah. like the training for them right yeah so that was amazing you put it so well because it was a great story to understand this mm-hmm. thing and it's it's actually the right mm-hmm. really right track putting the things in the right track great mm-hmm. okay so um i need to know that why mapping is important generally and uh, also specifically specifically for you because i read you are passionate about it so mm-hmm. what's the story behind that maps were just like art for me at one point because it was of course we are all introduced to maps through google google maps right navigating spaces but um i think in my uh, second year of college uh, in masters program we had a we had a specific uh, elective on how to map without doing it in a regular way like for example like how to how do you map intangible things for example you know uh, and there were very interesting ways of doing that some people used uh, there was this example where my professor had given where uh, you could map the time that you take to reach point a to point b by the number of songs that you listen in your car so if you say that you know this playlist has like 10 songs and it is like 3 minutes each you know that you will reach a space <laughs> so it was like very new ways of mapping dimensions like time space uh, experiences uh, colors uh, through mediums that were also very new um and the mediums that were uh, also very artistic so mapping was something that i used to think is a very technical purely technical thing but when you see that you know you can actually give a piece of paper and ask someone to map out their house or or the kind of movements they do in a day in their house um they they would actually be able to do that like a mind map and and you can map out literally anything you can see patterns in the map so i think for me patterns were very interesting to find in maps and uh, just to know uh, you know just to know that that this place exists uh, in the case of the commons when i was mapping the coastal commons in in the fishing community i really took inspiration from what saravan uh, uh, had done previously with you know mapping the commons uh because it was about making the invisible visible and it was it was truly to see and show you know like you may not see it now because these are temporal things but it is there it's there that people do use it to play people use it for social spaces uh when there is a uh, when there is a birth or a death or any any ceremony or tragedy all kinds of things these rituals happen in this space and you may not see that but uh, it's it's essential without the space that ritual will not happen and vice versa so i think uh, that cultural landscape is what i wanted to map and that became a very interesting topic for me so every time i go to any place i collect maps and i uh, try to see uh, what the city looks like on on from a birds eye view and how people relate to the space what they put as landmarks on their map you know like the spaces of importance for them um the spaces of conflict spaces of uh memories all of these can be mapped so i think it's a very interesting uh, exercise that can be done from a campus level to a city level to a home individual level and 
it has many styles it doesn't have to be like a google map alone can take the form of anything so that was a very interesting aspect for me so i think i will always continue to think about uh spaces not just uh through experiencing in person but also through maps so if you can't go to a place just go to google earth and see street view and you know sort of get a feel for the place uh, that's something i do a lot you know that's very interesting because you know a teacher can put you to love something or to hate something and what yeah. you told about your teacher i just fell in love for the mapping because yeah. i i do think mapping is something technical but now i can think mm-hmm. of creative ways of doing it and, and now i'm like yeah. you know and uh, only one thing <laughs> yeah. that i like to see on maps is what is near to what you know what are the neighbors who are mm-hmm. the neighbors what proximity mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. what which shops are near to which place and and identifying landmarks i enjoy identifying landmarks in a place yeah. but um, this is interesting yeah imitating a place in the, in how many songs you can reach there <laughs> yeah you can map time through yeah, music like yeah. that's a very interesting <laughs> way to exactly, look at exactly yeah that's amazing so i uh, do appreciate your teacher if you if <laughs> yeah. you're interested in him <laughs> okay so dhania your work experience and volunteer work is amazing and i really want to appreciate on that it's very inspiring um i have two questions for you regarding this first is how do you ensure participation of all age groups in your mm-hmm. community projects and secondly what have been your experience of working with different age groups yeah this is actually something i had to learn over a course of my uh research work and my project work which were not just research and i in it for me to get off my shell and be like uh you know come and do this research with me who they may or may not have the time for you you know that was the most important uh, uh issue for me because you are here to do that research but they are just doing their everyday work just you know like you have to be mindful of uh their time and their energy so uh um, again as part of my um learning in in my college we were told very clearly that you know the do's and don'ts of engaging with the community you, you should you should try and maintain a rapport over a period of time and not just make it like okay i'm going to come here and do research and suggest ideas and you have i'll i'll take data from you and collect information from you but i'm not going to share that information from me, with you later you know like that was an issue and that's why a lot of times researchers are looked upon as like you know with a doubtful mind by these communities because they're tired of being researched you know so they they want some action they are like okay you're going to ask more questions so sometimes you get to have a lot of um uh, opposition to that but if you have the right person to introduce you to these communities who they trust yeah so they trust and you are already solving an existing issue instead of telling them hey this is the issue i have identified and i think we have to solve it that doesn't work as well as them telling you we have a problem and why don't you use your you know tools and techniques to provide us some information or input or whatever so i think that was nurtured as part of my masters program we did that a lot uh, i must say that when i look back on how i did my project in kanagi nagar i feel like i could have changed a lot of the ways i worked with them because i never shared back the data with those communities and i remember feeling like i should probably try and translate all of that in the regional language and share it with them but it was too late like it was too much information and i hadn't thought about it previously but i could show the pictures and images but at the same time you have to make sure you don't give too much hopes that this will happen and then if it doesn't happen it leaves such a sour uh, feeling in that community it might not even be your intention but it might be other things for example suddenly funding might be cut away and suddenly the government will be like no we are changing election timing right now so you know we don't want to take up this project we'll have to put it on hold so 
you if we if that is the problem and you are in the in the mercy of an external uh, issue that makes this not progress it it does leave a little bit of like uh, disappointment in that community that you're working with but um, when i'm working with different groups i make sure that i see who is not there in the space uh, i try to see who is not using this space who is not participating in this um, and uh, why you know so when i think about present then i try to include that group um, and of course uh, including children in an activity is probably the easiest thing to do in terms of getting them to work on an activity but then to use them in a meaningful way and to act, you know not just be like okay draw this for me and that's it like you know make them part of the actual process of vision uh, creating an idea executing the idea because i've noticed that children are able to come up with creative ways to write and draw and tell what they would like to see in the future versus the elderly people usually the adults usually tend to say what the issues are in our community they they like to concentrate more on this is the problems we have and then you put the visions of the children and the and the problems and issues that the communities are facing together and you get like a more big picture of uh, of the of the particular uh, issue you're dealing with so i always tend to feel like adults come with negative uh, problems in their places and uh, children take a more solution oriented pathway to those same uh, problems uh but when you put them together there's a lot of exchange of ideas that can happen so intergenerational conversations um really change the way communities can think about the spaces but we have to uh try as practitioners make sure that you know like you provide that space for one group to uh, you know give that opinion fully before mingling those two groups together so for example in the coastal community that we worked in i found it very difficult to document what women were saying to me even though i am a woman uh, i was unable to get more women to speak out about the uh, community or be documented on a video or you know taken photographs of but the men were always there you would always see them uh, because women had their own Uh, duties that they were doing on a regular day and the timing that i went was not right so i realized that i had to change the timing in which i had to go and interact with them so that the women would be free and the men would be out you know doing whatever they're doing so uh, i had to find the right timing right methods and the right uh, tools for example for when i'm talking with women i tend to not take a video or a camera out i use usually use voice recorders um and because they are more comfortable that way un- unless they say i am fine with being recorded by video you know so uh whereas men are more open to like giving uh, inputs uh, verbally or in video format um these were all interesting things i had to navigate while working with communities and uh one uh, piece of advice that i got from practitioners uh, while doing the research was sometimes design can inhibit progress sometimes design can cause more problems maybe the solution is some, something that is not design oriented maybe it's a process issue maybe it's a communication issue maybe it's a policy issue so uh, as designers and architects i think we tend to jump immediately to a design solution but sometimes maybe not designing is also an option to you know think about or uh programming might be a useful way like partnerships might be a useful way to engage with the community uh, so that was a very interesting uh, piece of advice that i always carry with me so uh, take my designer hat off when i don't need to uh without going not going there with preconceived notions but have an open mind and see what is really needed before giving so and these communities work in silos sometimes and it's our duty 
to understand these social dynamics and why they happen uh and not judge that community for being a certain way you know like patriarchal or whatever so they are they function a certain way because of certain reasons so we need to be adapting to that and understanding that and at the same time trying to have those difficult conversations but that takes a long time so when you have limited time we focus on limited uh, problems and try to see what is in our hand to uh, document but most importantly share the information back with the community go back after your research share with them what you've collected in the in a language that they will understand in a format that will be accessible maybe a video or a bilingual uh, you know text or a map that is you know usable for them uh, maybe they have never seen a map of the community before that is drawn by them you know so that is a very nice uh, thing for them to hold on to and it's a useful tool for social justice as well okay so <laughs> you got me <laughs> and um thank you so much for sharing with such honesty and such openness all the lessons and especially the ones that uh, you made the wrong choices you know what were your mistakes and mm -hmm. um these are very valuable to me thank you so much for sharing that mm -hmm. and of course to all the people who will be listening and you are so right uh, about this thing that uh the elders are more focused on the problems and issues and sometimes nagging about it being angry about it and children are more like dreaming and they want to do things mm. they want to see things they are solely yeah. mission oriented and yes you are right and of course i have been through this thing that we have to ask these questions to them separately because sometimes the dynamic shift is that the children or the young especially the young ones they don't speak in front of elders <laughs> yeah because of uh, you know yeah, the yeah. desi system of criticism and sarcasm you know so judgment yeah. is, and of course uh, and yes you think you mentioned one more thing is to take your designer hat off and literally it took me 5 years to be in a place to yeah be with a social engagement and not come from the place of yeah. um, having all the answers to myself you know by myself and just yeah. getting answer from people yeah. trying to get answer from people and in this old right. thing that i was taught was right. to have clarity first my teacher told me that when you mm -hmm. are looking the clarity the community engagement will go not go the right way and the audience will be confused and right. i went through it <laughs> it was a nightmare and yeah i, I understand <laughs> and then secondly yeah. ask good ask good and great questions great questions basically asking the right question was the you know the best mm -hmm. advice and also something which really helped me and all of those things that you have yeah. said it, it's and asking amazing, the right thing i think you know the yeah. highlight of the uh, highlight of this whole uh, interview <laughs> this whole conversation i loved it thank you so much ma'am that's nice to hear yes you were saying something sorry that's Say. nice to hear no i was telling that you know if we could just collect a set of these questions and inputs on community engagement in our context it would be really useful uh, as a not just as a you know resource for others because we don't get these uh, information in college we don't get we don't learn these as a curriculum in our college even though architecture and urban design is such a, a public facing it's a service industry right so yes. we we don't get to learn this as a curriculum and we don't know the the impact of the negative impact of doing it wrongly you know, yeah. you know so uh, it's very important to have learnings from others who have done this and uh, you know it will be great to have like a manifesto of uh, community engagement for different age groups different contexts different um, you know needs and you know ways of working so i think that itself will be a very interesting um uh, entity of research to take up definitely yes and i uh, i was a um, few days back i was thinking of taking a course on community engagement practices you know mm -hmm. <laughs> i was trying yeah. to see that how it works but then again every community is unique you know there are different individuals yeah. you have to learn how to yeah. 
um talk to them and uh to be very honest about it like uh, when i did my first community engagement project or the place making project it was almost uh five years ago like in 2019 i did that right um i did, i learned a lot of lessons and um <laughs> it's also because when i was identified that uh, people were not the problem it, it was me <laughs> also because <laughs> you know um, first of all having a huge team that's mm. a problem because a lot of issues happen everywhere and if there is a lack of communication and and i am very open about it that we lack the communication skills because we weren't taught in mm. schools or in yeah. colleges or universities how to engage or how to communicate in a manner which is not just yeah. selling your product but actually listening listening was the yeah. we were yeah. taught to listen we were taught to talk to tell to direct to mm. lead lead or yeah. which is actually bossing around uh, lead, leadership is about listening more um so i learned that and i learned that how important it is to be able to focus on controlling your emotions because mm. a lot of things happen in a place which is triggering you know when you are engaged yeah. with people they tell you their stories or sometimes they tell you in a manner which is triggering to you and if you are not yeah. um having a command on your emotions or or if you are not aware that it's not coming from them it's coming from you so this sort yeah. of thing and uh, that actually put me on the path of taking a break from these events and work on my emotions first and you know getting to know myself and getting to know yeah especially my traumas from my country or from my people mm-hmm. yeah and then resolving it and then meeting them from the place like now i meet people from the understanding uh, and it was it is actually helpful because yeah it i'm able to identify how quickly i'm being triggered by someone and then i tell mm-hmm. them because i think we share this thing in Mm. in our south asian countries how there there are almost every time yep. like boundaries and uh, some unnecessary respect for elders like yeah. there is a yeah. respect for every gender yeah. you know elders come to you that we know better than you okay yeah, yeah, but yeah. what i know for myself is different so these lessons yeah. are actually very important and it's very came after being able to engage with people so that's very true yeah practicing brought these lessons so and yes what you said about the manifesto or you know doing research on community engagement um i'm not sure how it will go but i'm up for it so whenever there's something to let me know okay so then yeah so so questions so, so far were solely for you now i am going to, i'm going to ask you some question which i actually did rapid fire and i asked everyone because i love to know mm-hmm. the answers to it Uh, so tell me what drives you what keeps you focused on public spaces i just see way too many places that are abandoned or neglected or are, are waiting for it to be filled with activity or taken care of and that inspires me to do what i do because uh we have so much need to uh you know like create to mingle to socialize to uh care for our immediate neighborhoods which is possible in our own ways we don't have to depend solely on the the city or the pub you know the state to do something in order to um of course we need funds for which we need to sometimes depend on others but i think the initiation uh that that initial spark needs to happen through uh people who care about that space and i think that's what brings me to this line of work again and again because you you can work with anyone you can work with not just architects and designers you can work with the store owner who's lived in that street for years and he wants to do something about that street so that it becomes a better business opportunity for them you know it can be for a policeman who's live who's working there for a long time who sees how unsafe it is for uh, uh women or like children to be there after a certain time so it you can work with anyone so that's what i feel like the scope of this uh, that's what inspires me to keep doing it again and again that it's not just a private client you know with a plot of land who wants to build a space it's for it it's for the common good so i think that's what really motivates me 
Awesome. This is this is so pure, you know. So, so <laughs> okay. Uh, so, what are your lessons or the proud moment from your work life from being a placemaker or whatever you know your work journey is long. So, what is any proudest moment that you recall? Good memory. I think just getting into this whole community engagement aspect of public space uh, design, participatory design. it took a lot of you know like getting out of my own shell and imposter syndrome and trying to actually go there and face real communities with real problems and not just sit in a class and do a assumptive design brief you know it took a lot of uh, self motivation determination on my end and every time i do that it's a new community it's a new uh, project so every time i do that i feel very like uh, content and i feel like i'm very proud of what i am able to accomplish you know uh, despite despite the fact that some people think i'm very young or like you said you know sometimes they think you know what does she know or but those are all those are all evident like if you don't face those in a community engagement project then it is pro- you're probably not doing it the right way so that has encouraged me to sort of it's okay to do mistakes learn from it the communities are very welcoming to uh, accepting your if you accept your mistakes and be like hey i don't know this can we can we start fresh you know they're okay with that and the more often they see your face and see that you are invested in this beyond just your academics you are invested in this place for some reason uh, and they are also invested in it i think that brings you uh, closer to getting gaining that trust so yeah uh okay so <laughs> this is uh, something like it's a sort of um motivation for me because i'm still mm-hmm. in the stage when i coming out of my shell is a struggling part for me mm-hmm. like uh i'm doing it because i have to do it i get to do yeah. it actually so i'm still learning the i'm in the learning phase of coming out of my shell facing the discomfort and just trying to savor and trying to be grateful for all the results that come out of it so i'll always remember this that this is uh you know this is a rewarding thing and i in some point yeah. in life i look at it as an opportunity more than a challenge inshallah <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Thank you. yep yeah, amazing yeah, definitely Okay, and uh, what was the most struggling point for you, or the hardest memory, maybe? The first community engagement I did was definitely the hardest uh, for me because I remember someone literally asking me all liter. He he was being very candid, and he was just uh, one of the fishermen who was in that community. Just very candidly came up to us and was like. all these educated people they have no other job so it was it was a very uh, stark reality to me that to know that not everyone cares about what you do and you know it's it's fine like you you get to but in the same community there were other fishermen and fisher women and children who were actually taking my side and they were trying to talk for me and telling this guy uh, listen this is what they are doing don't talk like that and uh you know they are trying to do something useful they we need a map for our community so we are anyway going to get it done from her so i think uh, you have different kinds of personalities like like a family you know like you have these different personalities anywhere you go and i have learned to it's given me a lot more patience to deal with uh, so i think the first time i went there it was kind of a struggle uh, and uh, every time you go for getting grants or funding from a government or private funder and then it doesn't come through it's a disappointment and you have to just wait longer and longer and sometimes it never happens and you have to abandon that uh project idea and move on to something and that's always a disappointment and that's happened way many times then i can count but uh what it does do is it it lets the community take things in their own hand and do it in their own way like they after a point they realize okay you have all this uh resource now i can do something else with it so um they don't depend on other entities sometimes and sometimes it just becomes 
neglected and even worse so when you see those places it's always like disappointment you want to do something about it and uh, you know it's going to be way harder so yeah it's just something that you have to agree that you know you can't fix everything and just go ahead with life yes oh uh- every challenge or every failure comes with it lesson yeah. yeah and we be and we keep moving forward yes cool okay yep. so do you have any favorite quote or a mantra related to place making or any work that keeps you inspired well i think the work that keeps me inspired is of course a lot of people have spoken about jane jacobs but then william white had a lot of interesting uh, anecdotes about you know if you don't if you are having a fountain or a water body and if you don't let people use it it's like a crime you know you're like don't just put like a lawn i i feel that about lawns too like people have these grasses and lawns and then they put a board saying do not enter i'm like what is the point of that just looking at it from a distance that's a waste of uh, land so i i kind of take that in my work if it is not useful if it's not being used don't have it there you know like uh it's just not serving any purpose it's just going to be an aesthetic thing don't put it there um but sometimes you might look at commemorative plaques and uh, art forms that are just there for you know but it 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 brings in people sometimes and uh, it brings in that feeling that it's a public space sometimes so it it's a fine line between restricting people from using those spaces and not and another quote that i think It's also by William White. Surprisingly, is if you want if if you want to have a lot of people, uh, start by putting out food. You know, like that's a very, uh, very simple. It's not like a mantra, really. It's more like a hack, I would say. You know, so uh, just just these small things that can make a big difference. Um, and then you just adapt your style of doing things in your own way. For me. accessibility has been a core for uh, the work that i do whether it is access physically you know like or through data like for example i i said about sharing data so uh, that is important and not just designing a space but maintaining it is important um, and making sure people use it you know like you have a beautiful park don't close it you have a fountain or a water body don't tell people not to go and play in it you know so uh, i think access makes all the difference yes i get it and you're right and <laughs> any conference without refreshment <laughs> i don't think so anybody will go there <laughs> so yeah exactly right. yes we have learned it okay um do you have any opinion for pakistan or place making in pakistan just like to sh- you know actually i i had roommates in uh, my masters during my masters time i had roommates who were from pakistan and we spent like some 3 4 years together so i i a lot of what i know is through them al- also um and i i really like the work that uh, karachi collective does with art and bringing art into public spaces but at the same time as a tool to question certain norms in society you know like the ones that you said about uh getting through different generations and also taking space that already exists but seeing it in a different light so i think artists have done a lot of interesting work in uh pakistan and like the i think there was a biennale also that happened right some years back and that i i really liked some of the prim- uh, curations of that biennale i wish i could visit it some day but you know how <laughs> bureaucracy works within in pakistan so but it's been uh it it, it really makes me feel like uh, the walled city for example there's a, there is a lot of correlations that you can draw from how this walled city in uh, in in lahore uh, is it in lahore am i right is it lahore yeah so that um, and how it relates to some of the walled cities in india i've always wanted to like understand that dynamics there and there is a lot of history like shared history uh, heritage um, and art is not just in the built form right right like music um, i think the whole rich storytelling formats that they have they are all part of the 
uh, in, intangible assets of pakistan and i think that is like a real big asset that needs to be utilized and i and i see in photographs and documentaries that there are a lot of uh, abandoned buildings with beautiful architecture and beautiful social spaces which if with the right programming you know it can come alive and it can be a platform for temporal uh, activation it doesn't even have to be a permanent anything it can just be a temporary activation of a space and uh, i think that gives me a lot of hope also i like the work you do with campuses uh, i must say that you you know you started with like initiating place making activities in campuses and you still do work with um, children as well so i think campuses are a big untapped potential for initiating these out of box ideas because they have the resources space and they have willing people to contribute for it so that and i i always think about like so much space is open space is there in all these campus walls and if only they could become a little bit more social and public and um, you know have some of that urban commons feeling it would really uh, add to the momentum that place making is having in uh, smaller spaces like you know uh, not just in cities or regions but even within institutions and settings like uh, private spaces thank you so much i'm so touched you know you were saying it with so much sincerity and so much openness i was listening to it and i was like oh, wow nice okay yeah uh, thank you so much and uh, you thank you so much for paying attention actually for paying attention to these things mm-hmm. about pakistan and i'm so happy that uh, you were sharing your space with some good people from pakistan that left a good impression on you and uh yeah. and I, yes i do hope that i uh, i'm able to host you some day in lahore and wall city uh, yeah mm-hmm. we are hopeful about it <laughs> some day we have been yep okay so yeah. the next thing yeah. i would like to ask is is there any message for the global leaders because very young place making leaders are joining in so what would you like to tell them wow this this question takes a lot of thinking i don't want to like say something very normal uh wait but i i do think that for me i have noticed that people tend to work in silos right they tend to think that place making is for like most like architecture or design that only if you have like a designer perspective uh can you do it but it helps definitely but i definitely think if you are a young uh, person going into this field you can take so many different uh, you know ways of looking at it work with sociologists psychologists work with uh, you know like uh, environmentalist scientists technology people because you can do so much with technology in public space these days that you couldn't earlier um maybe work with uh, the local you know uh, panchayat but also work with police work with um uh, you know the business owner who's next to your uh, school um work with anyone who is willing to take care of that community um and for leaders who are already in the city who work with the city for example i would say make it easy for citizens and communities to take care of their spaces you know like remove some of the bureaucratic uh you know hurdles that are there that make a process so long and so large to do a good thing you know so uh, that is something i have personally faced and if i had that opportunity i would probably implement policies differently and make sure that you get grants for small community projects in your neighborhood so um yeah i i just would say just take care of the spaces that you are in join a community organization in your neighborhood join a welfare association in your in your residential community or create one if it doesn't exist um create relationships with the government local wards it might seem a little tricky because you don't want to be their yes man but at the same time they can really help push through certain uh projects that have never been uh, been possible before 
uh but at the same time not depending on them purely um yeah i think all of these and more that other placemakers have said in your podcast all of them are great uh, compilations of advice so this is just something from my own personal experience i wish uh we could have a better uh you know leadership in terms of making these things possible yeah that's so sweet actually your advice is it's very unique because and <laughs> how you put it in a manner is to inspire people in power to just say that try to make things easy for your people how can yeah. you really put that because it's <laughs> maybe this is this empathetic form is something which is going to uh, put them into service maybe somehow maybe we will try to <laughs> maybe <laughs> encourage them inspire them to think some 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 sort of good way and uh, i'm going to use this mind definitely please yeah. do yeah <laughs> thank spread you spread it aloud <laughs> yes and uh, and definitely for the young ones is to just hang out of the box and meet different yeah. people and yes yeah meet different people and yes also joining welfares and uh, you know the non profits it it helps you grow up in all the yeah. dimensions especially yeah in your empathy and in compassion towards other people that's so right okay thank you Definitely. so much sania thank you so much it was a um, very meaningful conversation and i'm so happy mm-hmm. to have it with you um i'll see you soon again we'll get, get in touch we'll stay in touch thank you so much yes it was very very meaningful for me as well and i definitely think with the, the commonalities that our regions have and i i think there is so much scope to learn from one another's uh, initiatives and um uh, it's always about cross cultural you know experiences and there is nothing like one set rule like you said you know we can't do engagement the same in every place so i think definitely having learnings from one another helps because this is such a new and up up and coming field uh that you know the better advo- advocacy work we have behind it uh, the the better it grows so yeah definitely awesome what a great ending note take care and i'll see you soon bye bye yes see you bye